Welcome, Robin. Hey, everybody. So the title of my talk is Now is Beautiful. And uh, the focus of this talk is going to be about how games are amazing and why we should all think about games more in our everyday life and why they're so special and why you are all so special. So this is a timeline. I actually stole this from the Violet talk. Um, I have started uh, in games from a very strange and different perspective. I started as an AI researcher. And I moved into games, and then I moved into commercial games, and now I don't know where I'm going. So that last box on the timeline is a big question mark, and that's part of the reason that I'm here. When I started making games, um, I had this history of theory. And so one of the first theories I was interested in was that people are fun. And since people make computers, computers are probably also fun. And as I worked with computers, I found that in many cases they were not fun. They were very frustrating and difficult to work with. They made your life more miserable than better. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe we should try and change that. So I got interested in AI and thinking about games, because games are fun. That's a computer use that we have that's worked out pretty well. And AI is also fun for people like me. So if we put those two things together, we should have a pretty good time. And that naturally led me to The Sims, which, as you all know, is a game that is fundamentally about simulation and AI. It's about people, how people behave, what they do when they're alone in their house, what they do when they're with friends, what they do when they're at work. Um, and in a way, uh, it was the best place for someone like me who was interested in people and also in games. And from The Sims, I ended up on the Wii, because it's probably true that if you take something that's fun on the PC and that it's about people and you put it on the Wii, it'll be kind of cool. And it was. It was an extremely fun project. It was interesting in many ways. And as I moved on from My Sims, I ended up on a team that was making a game uh, with Steven Spielberg, which has just been announced, which is called Boom Blocks. And strangely, My Sims, which involved building things, houses and furniture, with little tiny blocks, like Legos, um, Boom Blocks is about blowing up, building, destroying, creating, and smashing down blocks, actual blocks. And what's interesting about the Boom Blocks transition is that in addition to creativity, it involves sharing. So you will be able to make your own levels with the game and then send them to friends and share them. And I think that that's really interesting. And as I've worked on the project and seen what the team has created, I have been totally amazed by how much building and sharing is better than just building by yourself. So what's next? I don't know. And I've been thinking about that in the context of coming here. But I can't just talk about it without sharing some vocabulary with you about how games work. And so what I'm going to do is give you a little tiny slice of the vocabulary that's helped me think about how games work in both commercial gaming contexts and also academic contexts. Fun is a hard word. When I went through all those slides before, I used the word fun a lot. But it doesn't really mean anything. It means enjoyable, it means different things to different people. And so one of the mechanics that I have come to love is this system, MDA. M stands for mechanics. It's the rules as system that make up a game. That's everything from the rules of Hopscotch to the rules of Warhammer Online. You know, pick a game. Any game has rules, and the rules make mechanics. D is for dynamics, which is what happens when the player interacts with the rules. And it creates a system beyond the system of the rules. Without a player, a game is just a set of rules. And A is aesthetics. And this is the part that I'm most interested in, because this is the resulting experience from the players in engaging with that system. It's the part of the game that you take away that wasn't in the rules per se. And it wasn't even in the play, the dynamics per se. It's what comes from all of those things together with you. So 
<laughs> as a game designer and also as a designer in general, rules are really fun to think about. We love them. They, they give us a chance to say, and then this will happen, and then this will happen, and then this will happen. Oh, no, you can't do that yet. You have to wait. Now do this. And we hope that by designing those mechanics, we can design the aesthetic experience that you take away. That's our goal. But it's hard sometimes because the dynamics themselves are unpredictable. You know, maybe you had a bad day. Maybe your kids are, you know, bugging you. Hey, mom, I really need dinner. I really need dinner. Just one more minute. I just have to finish building this house. I just have to finish this little thing I'm doing. One second, one second. Maybe you have homework that you need to do. Maybe you're in a bad way. You know, your relationship isn't working out. There are a lot of things that might impact the dynamics that I have no control over as a designer. And that's true for anyone who designs anything. Everything from a chair to a steak dinner, right? So you have to sort of give a little and say, all right, we're going we're to accept the fact that we can't control those dynamics, but we're going to think about the representation in the system that we build. And that's what we do as designers, right? So there was a really interesting quote um, in one of the talks that we saw earlier, the Violet talk, and which was, why kill books to make digital books? And I thought about that a lot when I went home last night, or when I went to the hotel that is my home. Um, why kill games to make digital games? Why take away so many of the things that are true in the way we play and games that we play as people uh, in the process of making digital ones? Now, that might sound a little aggro or weird, so what do I mean by that? Here's some games we may have played when we were small. Some of them are formalized games. Some of them are play that we made up. Uh, some of them have points and systems for winning and rewards. And some of them are actually exploratory, something like spin the bottle, which if you play it, you don't know what's going to happen. It's more about the social dynamics than it is about the mechanics themselves. The bottle spinning is not really what you're paying attention to, in a way. What's true about all those games is that they involve groups of people. And as we've heard, things that happen when you're in groups are really interesting. You have competition, you have mock violence, you have hidden information. I have these cards that you can't see. You have misinformation. Oh, no, no, I won't do that on that turn. Go ahead, make that move. You have lies. Werewolf, if you guys have ever played it, is one of the most amazing games because it really only has, you know, one or two rules, and yet it's completely and totally involving. And subsequent versions of werewolf that you play with the same group of people. Who's the werewolf? Who's the sheriff? Are you telling me the truth? Those things are really interesting. And as we move further into digital games, I'm hoping that we get to some of these other things that happen in charades and bridge games that are played over the course of 20 or 30 years with a partner or a grandparent. But what's hard for digital games right now is simulating those people and those relationships. The magic circle that's made by a game that lets you switch things up. Yeah, you're my boss, but when we play squash, I'm a competitor equal to you. That is something that is hard to get to in a digital context, with computers as tools, with the systems that we have. So we've heard a little bit about what digital games can be like over the course of the conference, and I want to talk a little bit about that. This is what you might do in a game, in a very abstract from my sketchbook kind of way. You start somewhere, you do an activity for a while, and when you're good at it enough, you get a star and you move forward. Progress, you wins. Maybe you get an upgrade or something cool, more weapons, more ammo, more uh, cooler pants, a better shield, um, more friends. And as you play the game, you continue to do this over and over and over again. And I think a lot of people find that weird or scary. When you think about what that can be like in a digital game, you can start with some small things, and then the things can become harder and harder to do over time. Or you can start with two small things, and then four, and then six, and then eight. Arcade games are a perfect example of this kind of progression. But so are our lives. This graph is not unlike going to work every day and doing more and more tasks until you get a promotion, or going on more and more dates until you get engaged. 
And as we think about traditional forms of gameplay and things that we have done in the past,、um, like play with dolls, like play charades, like play fort, some of the forms don't have that graph-like consistency. Some of them are completely nonlinear, and it's harder and harder to make digital games feel rewarding the further you push out into this space. And that's something that we all struggle with as game designers. But luckily, we've only been making games for 50 odd years, and so we have plenty of time to solve these problems. What can we do with the sort of systems that we have now, given the way people are now? These are some things that I've been noticing、um, at the Lyft conference. About how people behave, and we had a really interesting workshop with some teenagers, and they talked about how they love Facebook. They love using digital tools to think about where they are, who they are, and where they're going to be. Am I going to go to a party? Am I going to go to college? The boundaries on who I am and where I am and where I I go as you move out into social software become broader and broader.、Uh, this little graph. Is in and of itself a very important cycle. Knowing where I am, where I'm going, and how I'm getting there, what my dialogue or my play says about me. And what's interesting to me is that the space between those two things, where I'm going and what I am being or who I am becoming, is the space of gameplay. That's where you find the player fantasy. That's where you find the aesthetic, the goal, or what we at EA call the X. Of a game. Here are some aesthetics from games that have been pretty popular uh, recently. Uh, this one is "I Am a Surgeon in a Soap Opera Emergency Room," and that's Trauma Center, which was made for the Nintendo Wii and DS. You zap little guys that appear inside of these bodies, and there's real organs, and you do real surgery. And you know, if you were to ask me five years ago if that was a game that a lot of people would buy, I would probably say no. But it's becoming sort of its own thing. It's got a sequel. It's moving forward. Here's another one. I am a girl discovering her past, which is strangely haunted. That's Trace Memory on the Nintendo DS, and it's a story that you move through, where you find out that your dad isn't really who he, who you thought he was, and this death in the family really had these extenuating circumstances, and it's about becoming an adult. I am an attorney solving odd crimes and protecting the innocent. This is Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney. I object. Nintendo DS, and it's super fun. It's a little exploratory and it's a little actiony, but not too much. And it's, it's actually done quite well. I am a warrior in a war-torn land. I'm not even going to bother listing all the platforms and forms that this game has taken, because it's just too much. And there's a reason that we make so many games about this stuff. There's a reason that we have these player fantasies and these aesthetic goals. There's a reason that they get explored in games. So let's talk about making games. What we're learning is that the mechanics are actually kind of hard, and especially if you focus on something like "I am a warrior in a war-torn land," making that feel more and more real, making that feel more and more engaging and more and more reflective of the actual worries and fears that we have, is just a lot of work. It can be grinding work for the developers. And also for the players, it can become an ever-engaging cycle of embattling, fighting, destroying. But what we are also realizing with games like the ones I mentioned earlier, the Attorney game, the, the Coming of Age game, is that the aesthetics can drive the mechanics, and you can do much less if you expose someone to something new. And I think that the champion of this is. The Wii and DS. The Nintendo platforms say, generally these games are going to be kind of small, but you're going to feel different when you play them. You're going to have a new fantasy. You're going to have a new experience, and that's one of the things that makes them great. And it's one of the reasons I love working at EA on these games. When you take the power of something that's pretty complex as a simulation and you simplify it and you put it into a smaller form that's quick and easy to get into, you get something really magical. 
And I think that the market is saying that they want more of that. So, why do you care? <laughs> That's why you care. Because Facebook is a game. And Facebook is one of the most compelling social applications out there for players in my demographic and yours. These are all the things that you can do or say about Facebook. These are some of the aesthetics and mechanics that exist in that space. It's chatty, it's social, it's automatic for the most part, but not too automatic, it's somewhat selective. It's fast and repetitive, but it's also rewarding. There are things you do in Facebook over and over again, and you say to yourself, why am I playing this silly zombie game? You're doing it because you're getting a little bit of a joke or a ha-ha out of it from your friends, and that makes it meaningful. And adding friends, chatting with them, adding friends, chatting with them, adding friends, chatting with them, high school, college, work, retirement. It's a huge franchise from a game's perspective. So, what are the stars on that graph? What are the rewards inside of Facebook? What are the mechanics that Facebook is doing well, that games do, that other apps are not doing? Well, you get more friends, and your number goes up. That's a pretty easy one. There's things like the graffiti application, which allow new pictures and new ideas to appear almost magically on your page. There are gifts you can give each other. You can send hugs. There's laughter that comes from just experiencing silly things people write on your page. There are actual wins in games. And there are photographs. And I think one of the most important things about Facebook is that it combines state about me with photos about me and friendships about me in a way that make me feel like I'm living. So I thought about this a lot over the last couple of days. The thing that Facebook does that's really cool is it lets me choose how I use it. It lets me decide what the, what the game is about. It also lets me gather my own rewards as I see fit. I don't have to have the hugs application. I don't have to have graffiti. I can do what I want. And in those choices, I am reflected. Facebook is me. It's about me in a way that actually many games are not. Even the attorney game, on some level, is not so much about me. Facebook is about me and not all of us. It's not about the designer. It's about the people that use it. And this is something that we all talk about with Web 2.0, but Facebook has nailed it. What is the aesthetic of Facebook? I asked myself that after all this discussion, and what I came up with is that I am a person living a fun life, and I am loved. Facebook makes people feel like they matter, like they have friends and a family across all kinds of distances, and these are themes that have come up in a lot of the talks here at Lyft. I ask myself how many games we make make you feel loved, how many applications we use make you feel special, rewarded, like it's important what you did. And aside from some very limited stars, I think we're being a little stingy. We could give more. We could probably give a lot more. The things that you do every day, the, 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 the mechanisms you go through in your life, can feel like work. Even a relationship can feel like work if the rewards aren't there. I'm going to go to Bhutan in a couple of weeks in mid-April, and I'm going to go on a long hike. I'm going to go up and down, and then up a little bit more, and then down some, and up a little bit more and down some. I won't get to take a shower for two weeks. I'm mostly going to be walking uphill. That probably doesn't sound like a vacation to most of you, but for me, it's going to be awesome. I'm so looking forward to it. Partly because it's an activity surrounding myself with an environment I don't get to see. Partly because I get to be with friends who I love, who I don't see very often. And partly because it's work. These are some of the things that apps are about right now. Does it feel good to be me in those apps? Sometimes, but not always. In Flickr, it feels awesome. There's a huge community, and there's tons of stuff to do. There are a lot of other opportunities out there. Things like Doppler, which allow me to care for each other virtually, actually by being in the same place. I'm so looking forward to some of the game stuff that's going to be in those apps. 
I'm not talking about giving people actual points or rewards. I'm talking about giving them space to create and play and smiling at them when they do something cool. Here are some other things that you might consider as aesthetics for applications. Put someone else at the center of this graph and you get something super, super amazing. Mobile, creative, communicative, always, always new, but not necessarily right now. These are things we hear about, and they're true for games and apps, and that's why I'm excited to have been here and seen all these talks and hear all this stuff. As we heard, it's important to be able to let players design and create and express, but we have to do it in small places, small steps, with aesthetics that are valuable to me. Game design is a literacy. It is an art form. Games feel good because they make you feel like your actions matter, and all apps can do this. We don't have to be afraid of it. We can embrace it and make it true for all things. We can smile more. That's it.